Good evening. Uh, welcome to everyone. My name is uh, Eric Neumeyer. I'm the head of the Department of Geography and Environment here at the LSE. It is a great pleasure to host tonight and to be chairing this event with uh, Fred Pierce, who is here to talk about his new book, uh, The Land uh, Grabbers. Uh, Fred is a world-renowned environmental journalist who writes a lot for the New Scientist, for The Guardian, The Mail on Sunday, and other uh, publications. Uh, in fact, uh, when I went to Boston over the weekend um, to a conference on sustainability and inequality, I was talking about the, this event that I was going to chair on, on Monday, and uh, Jim, Jim Boyce, who was uh, a keynote speaker there, said, oh, is that the Fred Pierce of the New Scientist? So clearly... Uh, you are, uh, you are, and your work are well known. Uh, Fred is the author of a dozen or so uh, books, give or take. Depends what you count. <laughs> yeah. Depends on what you count. Uh, and um, uh, it is a great pleasure to uh, have him here. Fred is going to speak for about 35 minutes, and we have two co-discussants, so to speak. Now, that is not particularly usual at LSE, and it isn't because we are suspicious of anything Fred is going to say. Fred himself was interested in having sort of a, a, an active debate with some of the uh, academics here, and we uh, are glad to have two of the finest academics at LSE working on this issue. Uh, first of all, at the end of the table, uh, Dr. Charles Palmer, who is a lecturer in environment and development here in the Department of Geography and Environment, and Professor, An professor Anthony Hall, who is a professor of uh, social policy. Guess what department? Department of Social uh, Policy. Good guess. <laughs> Good guess. <laughs> uh, both have worked extensively on deforestation, on ecosystem services, on all sorts of things having to do directly or indirectly with land use. Uh, so I think uh, both are extremely qualified to uh, discuss some of these um, issues. Um, we are thinking 10 minutes for each after the presentation. Then we will open it up for a general question and answer session, which should still give us half an hour. So please join me in welcoming... Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. Fabulously good audience, actually. I'm really pleased. Um, this is the cover of my book. Um, it's a work of journalism, I guess, rather than um, an, a work of, uh, of academia. Um, I hope it's not uh, Newsnight-style shoddy journalism. I hope it's good journalism. But it is, at any rate, reportage with references. Let's put it that way. It's a global investigation um, of land grabbing, this new phenomenon really of the last five years of people buying up farmland across the world to grow crops for the global market in farm products, crops like corn and palm oil, sugar and biofuels, all of which seem to have rising prices making their production more and more profitable and holding the land where you can grow the stuff more and more profitable. And some of the most unlikely places are being snapped up. And gullible governments, I think they're gullible, are selling land cheap, sometimes actually giving it away free in the belief that it will bring economic development to their countries, particularly in Africa. Too often, I find, um, I think it is unlikely to do anything of the sort. It's early days sometimes, but the evidence is that people want to quick get in, grab their profit, and get out. And I'm afraid too many corporations investing in Africa in particular take that approach. Um, this man may be the world's top land grabber. He'd certainly like to be. His name is Sai Ramakrishna Karaturi, an engineer from Bangalore who grows a tenth of the world's traded roses. So, you know, if you're buying a rose on Valentine's Day, 10% chance that it comes from one of his greenhouses he does this. Um, no, his greenhouses don't take a huge amount of land, but he now wants to move 
into mainstream agriculture. He wants, he says, a million hectares of land under his ploughs in Africa. Now, I don't know how good your geography is, whether you can imagine a million hectares, but it's an area slightly larger than Kent, Surrey, and East and West Sussex combined. It's a lot of land, and that's his ambition for the next five years. He already has some. This is a soggy bit um, in Ethiopia. He just grabbed his first 100,000 hectares of soil in Gambella, in a remote corner of southwest Ethiopia, not a kind of place where anybody has thought of by any outsider has thought of buying land before. But he's taken, as I say, 100,000 hectares. That's Luxembourg and a bit more. And it's good land. His project manager told me that it is some of the richest soil that he'd ever worked. 5% organic matter, he told me. Plenty of water. In fact, the water, this is more or less on the headwaters of the Nile. Um, we can grow anything here, his manager told me. We don't even need fertilizer. I think after a couple of years they will, but they're starting off without. The soil is so good. Expensive, you might think. Um, but no, the rent is £200, $300 a day. Land the size of Luxembourg for not much more than you would pay to rent a nice apartment in central London. And that's kind of typical of the kind of deals that are happening. Immensely cheap profit, potentially profitable purchases being made, or more typically actually leasing, but he's got a 50-year uh, lease. Land grabbers like him there are a lot of Chinese entrepreneurs, there are Gulf oil shakes, there are Wall Street speculators, City of London speculators, are gobbling up the wide open spaces across the plains of Africa, the paddy fields of Southeast Asia, I went to the forests of South America, the steppes of Russia, you name it, they're there. The scale is frankly amazing. It's difficult to know the precise numbers, um, nobody really knows, but Oxfam estimates that something over 200 million hectares um, have been uh, appropriated in the past decade. They've not all been farmed yet, but have been taken. That's an area the size of Britain, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, and the Benelux countries put together. All in the name of feeding the world. Well, that's what we're told. The problem is, as far as I'm concerned, that the land is being taken from some of the world's poorest and often hungriest people, people who need that land to stay fed and whose power to prevent their governments from selling their land from beneath them is very small. To me, they look like victims, not the beneficiaries of foreign investment. They're people like Omod, who I met in Gambella, where Karaturi operates. His land is being taken by one of the new land grabbers there. I met him in a forest clearing where he said his ancestors had lived for 10 generations. You can see he's sitting on a buckskin um, in a clearing. Um, but they're not going to be there for much longer, or I, wouldn't, I would guess not. We used to sell honey, he told me. But two years ago, the company, the land grabber, began chopping down our forest, and the bees went away. We used to hunt. But after the farm came, the wild animals disappeared. Now we only have fish, he told me. Um, and he won't have that for much longer, I think. His clearing was just behind those trees on the top left there. The company is digging a canal, as you can see, and a road close to his hut to drain the nearby wetland. So the fish, I fear, will soon be gone too. He will have nothing left. His environment on which he depends will be gone. He told me when my father died, he said, don't leave the land. And we made a promise that we wouldn't leave. We can't give it to the foreigners, he told me. But in truth, I think his, his children probably have no future there. During my visit, the government was rounding up people and sending them to the towns and to new villages. It was a huge villagization problem, uh, program involving roughly a third of all the people in Gambella. Um, done, they said, in the name of providing services, but actually being done to remove the people from the land being handed over to <coughs> outside agriculturalists. Uh, it's not going too well. I think, actually, months after my visit, there was an armed rebellion um, 
that began at one of the land grabbers' camps. So what is being talked about as investment for uh, development of the region looks like uh, uh, a down payment on, on, on a little nasty little civil war. We shall see. In researching my book, I found I followed the trail from boardrooms and ministries to the fields and forests where I met numerous such victims uh, of, uh, like Omot of globalized land grab. And I make no apologies for taking their side. It seems to me that what's going on here, whatever you think about the economics, is an injustice, a major injustice. There were herders like these on the edge of the Sahara who found their cattle trails being turned into tarmac roads, as here, and their pastures fenced in for sugar and rice farms. I met Cambodians run out of town by their own senators who were selling sugar to Tate and Lyle. It turns up at the uh, refinery on the Thames estuary. And I met representatives of Paraguayan indigenous people ejected from their land by Brazilian ranchers who've taken over as effectively border area about 50 kilometers in, on the north of Paraguay, which is effectively now owned by Brazilians. Major land ownership changes going on. This is a picture I took in of the Chaco Forest in Paraguay, which is being rapidly cleared by the Brazilian ranchers. Each of this is taken from a fairly low-flying aircraft, but each of those patches is one square kilometer. All of it all those patches had been cleared in the previous year, I was told. Now, down there somewhere are some of the world's last contacted, rather uncontacted, people. Tribes that really have virtually no, or indeed absolutely no, uh, link up with people outside the forest. They're now living within the sound of the land grabbers' bulldozers. Nobody asked them, for sure, whether they were happy to give up their land to the ranchers. So here are two questions that we need to keep asking, or at any rate, I ask myself. First, is this fair? Have these people given consent to their land being taken over? In general, the answer must be no. If they have, fine. But if they haven't, I have a question. And also, does it make sense, in economic terms, to trash the lives of people like Omot and the millions of others in the name of feeding the world's poor? And I'll come back to that. Well, I'll come back to them both. But first, why is this happening and why now? The new land grab, the new land rush, began in 2008 after the soaring price of uh, food sent shockwaves around the world. Some of you may remember it was headline news for a while. The immediate cause of the rising prices was droughts, particularly in Australia, a major food exporter. But people began to fear that after a couple of decades of cheap food supplies around the world, that something was going wrong with food production. Perhaps there were too many of us. Um, perhaps the era of uh, cheap food was gone and a new era of expensive food and food shortages had arrived. That was the perception anyway. There was a spectre of kind of Malthusian famines returning. Um, and not just among sort of fringe environment groups. The British government chief scientist, John Beddington, saw not a blip in these sudden rises in food prices. He saw a long-term trend and he talked about what he called a perfect storm, in which a combination of climate change and rising world population, disintegrating ecosystems and land and water shortages were going to create an escalating food crisis over the next decades that could see, as he said, hundreds of millions starve. Well, you know, people have said those kind of things before and they haven't happened, but that was the concern, that was the environment in which land grabs started to happen. Yo-yoing food prices and an increasing expectation that they were on a long-term <coughs> upward trend. Governments got fearful, and they were right to be fearful. Historians among you will know that bread riots are bad news for governments almost wherever they happen. They bring down governments. And high food prices have caused food riots in the last five years. Here we are in Tahrir Square in Cairo. Um, that is a bread helmet, um, they tell me. That's what it was called. That is, at any rate, bread on his right ear. We like to think that the Arab Spring was due to a popular demand for democracy, 
But actually, a lot of the people demonstrating in Egypt and Tunisia that year, um, like this guy, were protesting principally about food prices, uh, demonstrated by the bread helmet. To try and insulate themselves from this kind of thing, a number of major food importing nations with more organized governments, like China and Korea and Saudi Arabia, have begun scouring the world looking for cheap, secure land to grow crops for their citizens back home. And they've been recruiting their national corporations, Daewoo in, Saudi, in uh, South Korea and others, to take over the land and set up large agribusiness corporations. South Korea set a target to establish Korean-owned farms on foreign soil to grow a quarter of that country's food by 2030. It's had some hiccups along the way. Daewoo caused a coup in, in Madagascar by, uh, by trying to take over large areas of, uh, of arable land, but it's still trying, and, that, and that, was there, that deal was called off. But Korea is still on course to get that land. And once food prices started rising with governments and major agribusiness corporations moving in, um, speculators as you might, might imagine, joined in too. They saw rising prices for food commodities, rising prices for land. They figured that there were coming food shortages and there were profits to be made. Here we have George Soros, one of the most famous investors, I guess, certainly one that, uh, that many other investors will follow. And he was saying in 2009, I'm convinced that farmland is going to be one of the best investments of our time. He's personally been buying in Brazil. I saw one of his farms, and a lot of other investors have followed. Since 2008, 2009, investment bank, banks and hedge funds and so on have been fencing in African land in particular. It's the cheapest. Um, and cornering the market in everything from Brazilian soy fields to Chinese poultry farms and so on. Goldman Sachs have been buying up Chinese poultry farms, which is a curiosity, but I guess they know what they're doing. I found British land grabbers, um, big corporations but speculative investors too, in 20 African countries. Associated British Foods, one of our largest food combines, acquired 120,000 hectares of sugar plantations in six African countries. A British banker called Leonard Thatcher, no relation that I know of, claims control of more than half a million hectares in the new state of South Sudan in a deal done with an aged chief whose people have since denounced the deal. And indeed, so has he. So maybe he won't get his hands on the land. But that was the deal that was done. Some unexpected people get involved. General Sir Redmond Watt, who uh, commanded British land forces... Britain's top soldier until 2008, and who organized the Queen Mother's funeral, turned out to be chairing a company with options on more than 200,000 hectares of bush in Guinea, in West Africa. Uh, it was a deal done with the government, but they tried to pay a little bit of compensation to the villagers whose land was being taken. One village, they told me, was persuaded to sell its land for three pounds. Not a small amount of land, we're talking about a large area of grazing land for three pounds. This is not precisely the land, but good land uh, like this. Why do African governments go along with this kind of thing? Why indeed do some of them encourage it? Have an open door policy for foreign investors. Well, some people talk about corruption, and I'm sure sometimes, you know, some people get a bit on the side. But they also do believe that almost any foreign investment must be good. That's the prevailing view if you talk to officials and min indeed ministers across Africa. Almost any foreign investment must be good. They often feel guilty, the more aware ones often feel guilty about their past failure to invest in agriculture, hugely underinvested in over the last 50 years since independence, essentially. Um, but they react to that by not discriminating between good investment and what is frankly get-rich-quick speculation, and there's been too much of the latter. It's not all bad. I've seen some good stuff. Some companies do intend to be there for the long term. Oddly enough, some of them are palm oil companies, which get a bad press, uh, quite reasonably, for their environmental damage, but actually do have an interest in being there in the long term, because they're going to grow, or they're going to uh, harvest their 
crops over perhaps a 30-year cycle. They need to invest a bit in the land and indeed in the people, so they're often not too bad. Um, in Liberia, this is here, I found a British palm oil company, um, got nearly 200,000 hectares, but it was reviving an abandoned existing plantation. And it was also offering to buy produce from local smallholders, which seems to me a better model for land grabbers. If they're going to be involved in, in taking over land, well, take a bit of land, but then buy stuff from local farmers, local smallholders. That may be a more useful model than the slamming quick and get out one. But at any rate, it had built this new school. These kids hadn't had a school before. So good stuff can happen. But from what I saw, too much of the investment has been bad news for locals. They've been turfed off their land. Often the contracts stipulate that the land will be given to them without any people on it. And the people thrown off the land get no compensation, no really anything. They're just impoverished by the process. They're certainly not developed by it. There are other issues, other resources involved here sometimes. Often land grabs are really water grabs. Water to irrigate crops is an increasingly short supply around the world. Countries like Saudi Arabia, one of the biggest land grabbers, after all have plenty of land. The trouble is it's desert. What they need is land with water for irrigating crops. One estimate is that uh, food production in a fifth of the world today is limited not by land shortages but by water shortages. So land with water is a key commodity. But water, grab, water grabs can be disastrous too. I went to Mali in West Africa on the edge of the Sahara where the government is taking water out of the river Niger as here using this barrage for big sugar and rice schemes being developed by the Chinese and the Libyans and the Qataris and others. Large projects irrigating the desert. Sounds good, but immediately downstream of this barrage taking the water is one of, frankly, nature's great aquatic marvels, the inland delta of the river Niger. It's a vast wetland the size of Belgium, and it's not just for nature. There are a couple of million people living there by fishing, gathering the rich lake grasses, farming, rearing livestock on, on pasture land. It's a wonderful, and I spent some days there, uh, sustainable management of a very rich ecosystem. You couldn't do better. Um, but it is in serious trouble. I mean, those are just some boats on the delta. Hydrologists reckon that hundreds of square kilometers of the wetland will dry out as a result of the new irrigation schemes being built. Tens of thousands of livelihoods will be lost. Yes, they'll have more rice. Yes, they'll have more sugar for export. But what is being lost? The livelihoods of thousands, tens, probably hundreds of thousands of people, ultimately. I met Dauda Sanankua, who's the mayor of a big chunk of the wetland. Uh, he travelled by boat overnight to meet me. Um, not many people go into the wetland to discuss their problems. He was very keen to talk. Everything here, he told me, depends on the water. The government is taking our water. It doesn't even tell us what it is doing. And that anger was arguably one cause of some of the unrest in the country that began this summer. I wouldn't say it's the primary cause, but I certainly met people on the wetland who were growing angry, and they are right on the border area between where the rebels are and where the government is still in control. So there are consequences, political consequences, for the, some of these land grabs and water grabs. Often, as I say, water, grabbers are taking water and land at the same time. Here is in Kenya, in East Africa, where I met angry locals who'd been fenced out of the Yala Swamp on the shores of Lake Victoria. Uh, the fence was put up by an evangelical American real, on, real estate entrepreneur called Calvin Burgess, a man who made his runny, money running privatized American prisons. He's now investing some of his profits in buying pieces of Africa. He calls this one Dominion Farm. Um, I'm not sure about the name, I'm really not. Uh, it's draining the swamp to irrigate rice. And this, as you will guess, is the boundary between the papyrus of the swamp and one of his new rice fields. Here is one of his, well, here is his American farm manager 
who took me round. He was proud of his farm. He's, uh, he knows all about draining swamps. He comes from Louisiana. He's been, he's been draining swamps all his life. Um, and I'm sure he knows what he's doing. But then meet one of the locals. 74-year-old Dalmas. There's the fence of the farm in the background who told me we all used to live in the swamp. Me and my 17 brothers and sisters were born there. I had big families back there. My grandfather died there, he said. We had 100 cattle in our family then. Uh, no more. Most of the village's adults were indeed born inside the swamp, but are now living huddled in squatter colonies round this fence, around the edge of their farm. And all their cattle, virtually all their cattle, are gone. This is supposed to be development to help a poor community. It certainly hasn't worked out like that. Certainly not for them. They are indisputably poorer. They've also lost a lot of their liberty. Uh, I don't know if you can read that. That's a letter they showed me when I visited. They had to get it from the company, the company's security services um, in order for them to be able to walk on what seemed to be a public road to take me around to show me uh, their side of the story about what was happening in the farm. I could go down the road unencumbered, but if they wanted to go with me and show me around, they needed this letter. The whole area felt like a kind of prison camp. It didn't look like development to me. Poor rural Africa, as you will begin to gather, is at the heart of this. It's one of the last great, unfenced, fertile areas of the planet. People want that land. The World Bank says this roughly four million square kilometers of the savanna grasslands between the rainforests and the desert are what people want. It's the yellow area on that map, the Guinea savanna zone, as geographers will call it. The bank calls it the world's last large reserve of underused land. A land that African leaders will often say could feed the world. Well, maybe. But the trouble is that this underused land is home to half a billion Africans. Peasant farmers, hunters, herders, uh, they use this land, all of it. There is very little land out there which isn't claimed and mostly used by somebody. And these are among the world's poorest people. Now, they badly need economic development. Nothing that I say suggests that they should stay in the plight that they, current, that they currently are. And, of course, economic development is what the land grabbers, the foreign investors, promise. But I don't see much sign of development, and I have serious questions about whether it will be delivered. There are too many examples of failed development projects in Africa for us to be sanguine about what's going on. And there's another problem. Despite the frequent talk about needing this land to feed the world, and that's what's on the prospectuses of many of the, uh, of the would-be investors as they go around the city uh, looking for money, um, many of the land gathers, however, are not growing food at all. Uh, one of the biggest uh, growth areas in, in, during the land grabbing time has been for biofuels. Biofuels are spreading across Africa in Mozambique, Biofuel concessions now cover an area larger than Scotland. British biofuel companies have been the biggest land grabbers of all in Africa. Now, some biofuels have done well. Palm oil is increasingly grown as a biofuel across Africa, as well as for food and cosmetics and so on. But others have not. Perhaps the best example of this is Jatropha. Um, a report by Goldman Sachs back in 2007 hailed Jatropha as a new wonder crop. Uh, just squash the fruit and basically produce biodiesel as substitute for diesel in vehicles. Many rushed to plant what was still basically, however, an African weed. Uh, lots of people, as I say, tried it and hopes were high. And Sun Biofuels, the company that's a grab from their website, uh, was among them. Sun Biofuels, with big city backing, um, breezed into Tanzania and Mozambique and planted tens of thousands of hectares. The company persuaded the British Overseas Development Minister, Stephen O'Brien, to go out there to do some publicity. And he got headlines for saying that the project was, quote, a shining example for countries around the world as to how to produce green energy. 
Uh, Jatrofa hasn't delivered. Um, embarrassingly for the minister, just four months later, Sun Biofuels went out of business, uh, leaving behind abandoned land and angry locals. Actually, the land is still fenced off, awaiting a new buyer. So the locals have neither their land nor any job on the farm, worst of all worlds. During my research, I also got concerned about the role of environmentalists as land grabbers, green grabbers, if you will. They too want land to protect nature, to encourage nature tourism sometimes, to provide revenue so that they can protect more nature. They have a business plan, but often they don't care too much who they take the land from. Because green grab can be big business. The Maasai in East Africa, um, a tribe which over hundreds, probably thousands of years, has managed to live in harmony with wildlife, which is why there's so much wildlife left in East Africa, uh, graze their cattle on the same land as elephants and giraffes and so on are wandering through. They clearly know how to do it, um, but they are having their land taken from them. A fifth of Kenya today is given over to national parks for foreign tourists, um, much of it uh, former Maasai land. Um, private wildlife parks are proliferating in East and indeed in Southern Africa even more. And there are hunting concessions too. In Tanzania, one big chunk of the Serengeti Plain, formerly the heartland of the Maasai, is set aside now for the exclusive use of hunters from the United Arab Emirates. The area is so much, part, so much not part of Tanzania that even the airwaves seem to have been taken over. If you drive anywhere near, your mobile phone will suddenly beep and it will welcome you to the United Arab Emirates. Tanzania, it is not anymore. Um, green grabs are kind of sideshow in this, but I think they're, they're a significant one and they kind of. And certainly environmentalists and private people who want to take over chunks of land for their own spiritual edification or to make profit or for whatever, they're regarded by local, um, local people in much the same light as, uh, as big business agriculturalists. They are simply grabbers moving in on their land. I don't think the environmentalists are going to get very far with that kind of adversarial approach, which still pervades, they're perhaps better than they were, but still pervades too much environmental activity in the developing world. But put all this together. Um, what I think is happening is that many countries are losing control of their own land to foreign land grabbers. The governments are often are more than complicit. They encourage the process. They're taking land which um, uh, in past eras has been nationalized in the name of helping the people. That was the socialist model of how to provide development in, in Africa and indeed elsewhere was to collective, have collective ownership of the land. But that collectively owned land is now being leased or sold off to foreign investors. They're losing control of their land. When the new state of South Sudan raised the flag in July last year, a tenth of its territory had already been leased to foreigners. Wall Street speculators to Egyptian farmers uh, to a Gulf Zoo, which probably wanted to air freight some uh, wildlife back to the Gulf. A tenth of the land handed over before the state even existed. It was all done by the provisional government. Three quarters of Liberia in West Africa, a country recovering from civil war, is now parceled out in concessions for logging companies, mining companies, palm oil plantations like the one you saw, rubber plantations like Firestone, which has been there for a long, long time, and the like. Um, I'm not sure that this is a sustainable model for Africa or indeed anywhere else. Handing over the most fundamental resource of, for many of these countries, their land, just handing it over uh, for foreign exploitation. Nor I think of the methods that are being used right. This is the sort of model for the high-tech prairie-style agriculture that most of the agricultural land grabbers say they want to bring to Africa. This is going to transform African agriculture. They're going to do it with big kit like this. This is in Kenya. And yet, even among the land grabbers, many of them don't seriously believe, despite what the prospectuses of their companies say, don't seriously believe that mechanised 
prairie style agriculture is seriously going to deliver uh, development in Africa. It's done some quite interesting things in Brazil. I wouldn't say that it can't be done in the tropics, um, but I don't think Africa is the same as Brazil. At any rate, in 2008, James Siggs, who's a British farmer from Yorkshire, I think, joined up with a Canadian venture capitalist to create what they called US-style large-scale agriculture on 100,000 hectares that they'd leased in the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo. The company said that it would be a breakthrough for that country's development. It could feed Africa. Its website, if you look, is still full of pictures of combine harvesters charging across Africa for all the world as if it was the American prairie. But a couple of years later, I heard SIGS admit at a conference that, quote, industrial-scale farming displaces and alienates people, creates few jobs, well, you've got all this kit, you don't need many African employees, creates few jobs and causes social disruption. And surely that is closer to the truth. <coughs> Displacing and alienating people, creating few jobs and causing social disruption. Some say that present farming is doomed, that we've simply got to move to large farms. And there's a long, there's a big debate in the uh, development literature about whether small farms or big farms are going to be best in Africa and elsewhere. Some say that only big farming with big kit like this can feed the world. Um, I'm inclined to disagree. I think I am probably am biased having met many of the people who are losing their land. But there is a lot of research that I've read which suggests that, in fact, small farmers are very often delivering higher yields on their, the, on their land than big farms. Their interest is in maximizing farm production. Agribusiness and investors, their interest is in maximizing profit. And that can be quite a different thing. Where the, agri where the agribusiness people are pl uh, parking this farm machinery, the smallholder may have a kitchen garden, may have chickens running through the yard. They're working harder on their land. Um, it's not always true, but I think there is a case to be made for saying that the best way to do development is going to be to invest in smallholder farmers. And I saw a lot of instances of people doing good stuff. Even in Africa, where a lot of things go wrong, it can be very difficult. So, here is Beni Kombo in Kenya, who sold his fruit to local towns and was actually exporting to Gulf states. In Zanzibar, a lot of small farmers getting together to set up dairy businesses that are selling to towns on the island and beyond. And there are fresh greens, fresh green beans, being air freighted to Europe from Kenya. Um, this is Jacob, who makes a very good living selling green beans from his small holding near Nairobi to a British company that sells them to UK supermarkets. If you pick up on a Saturday morning a package of green beans that says that it's produce of Kenya, it'll have come probably from smallholder farmers such as him. He's doing very well out of it, so please keep buying the beans. Some farmers are setting up processing businesses so they can make greater profits from their produce. They're planting trees, they're digging terraces to improve their land. They're setting up tourist lodges. This is um, a wonderful lodge, Il Ilangwezi, in Maasai land um, in Kenya, where you have to uh, pay $150 a night to stay, and it's a wonderful experience. Um, I think investing in small farmers, small landowners, tribal groups where they still persist is going to be key. Africa's future lies in helping its small farmers find new crops, new markets, and sometimes new confidence, not fencing off their land and packing them off to the cities. I don't believe that's the way forward. We need less big kit. We need fewer fences like this one. This is around Dominion Farm in Kenya. We need small, more smallholders in fields like these guys in Liberia. Here's another truth. The world already grows enough food to feed 10 billion people. This idea that we've got to annex all the land because otherwise we won't be able to feed the world is really not true. 
The trouble is we only eat about two-thirds of that food. A lot of it rots. It's eaten by rats and pests, or it's thrown away in the bin by us, or quite a lot of it is turned into biofuels these days. And, of course, some of the land is used for growing non-food crops, uh, cotton and rubber and so on. Um, A billion people today go hungry or don't have enough food, not because there is no food, but because we cannot help the hungry grow their own food or distribute equitably what we have. Whenever there's a famine, after all, in some godforsaken corner of Africa, you can be pretty sure that there is food in the warehouses somewhere where hoarders won't sell because they're waiting for the prices to rise. And the problem is that the poor are too hungry, are too, excuse me, the hungry are too poor to buy. Poverty is what needs addressing here. The problem is not shortage of land, it's poverty. Given that, it seems to me that making the hungry even poorer by taking their land doesn't look like a good place to start with development. We should, I think, probably there are codes of practice and things being developed. The UN is talking about it, what might be good land grabbing and bad land grabbing. I think probably we ought to ban it, except under circumstances where we know that the locals have bought into it and have given their consent. We ought to ban the land grabbers and start investing in the real farmers, and usually that means the local smallholders. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Fred, for what I thought was a uh, very uh, engaging talk. It works very well together with these powerful uh, pictures. I think I can learn something from my own lecture there, which are all all uh, text-laden. Whilst we're getting ready for our uh, core discussions, can I just uh, make two quick announcements, uh, which I forgot. First of all, we are recording the event, which we will promote then on... Departmental website. You can also sort of download it on iTunes and other places. And second, of course, uh, Fred at the end of the event tonight will be happy to sign copies of his book, which are on sale outside. So if you're interested after the talk, please make your way outside to get the book and then come back inside for Fred to sign. Good. So we will now have. Um, short presentations by the coders cousin and we'll start with Anthony okay oh my <laughs> well thank Anthony. you Fred that was a great talk thank you um, and um, I enjoyed your book very much to prove it I bought a copy <laughs> that's my commitment um, much of what you say resonates very strongly with me having looked at um South America, Brazil, uh, and, and sort of development issues in general. But you managed to, to capture this process in a, a, a brilliant selection of visits and case studies, as we would say in academia, uh, which uh, is extremely readable and accessible. So I strongly recommend that, that people buy the book. It's very, very educational, and it, the, sort of the issues come, come to life on the pages very, very strongly. Um, now, it was suggested that we should try and offer opposing views. Um, the problem is that I agree with practically everything that Fred says, you know. And I'm not one of these people who can be a sort of a, a force or artificial opponent. I've got to really believe what I'm saying before it has any conviction at all. Um, what I might do, though, actually is here it comes is to pick up on one of the sections that, that Fred um, writes about concerning concerning the issue of climate change and uh, carbon rights here on page where are we towards the end here 300 and 315 where he spends uh, a few pages discussing the implications of uh, climate change policy, uh, conservation, and the issue of carbon rights for, for land and how it's related. And at first sight, of course, there doesn't seem to be much direct relationship, but thinking about it, 
I would call it a sort of a third branch of this argument. We start off with uh, land rights, water rights, and I think carbon rights is a logical next step, and one which is likely to expand considerably in terms of the commercial attractiveness to investors and to governments in terms of securing land. Um, as most of you know, un under the Kyoto Protocol, industrialized countries can offset their carbon emissions by supporting emissions reduction schemes in the South, including forest projects. About between 18 and 20 percent of greenhouse gas emissions around the world uh, are caused by land use change and forest destruction, just the second largest source after energy production. So th there, are, there are two major sources of potential profits here. First of all, within the compliance structure of the Kyoto Protocol and the Clean Development Mechanism, whereby um, proge projects can be set up for afforestation and reforestation. But that's just a small proportion. Only 1% of these are allowed. 1% uh, of the total is allowed to take the form of forest projects. Uh, roughly 40 out of 5,000 clean development mechanism projects are actually uh, to do with the forestation and reforestation. So you may dismiss this, oh, well, small fry, nothing to worry about, we're okay. The problem is um, red. Nothing to do with socialism. Uh, if you were a perverse critic, you could call it the red peril, uh, and I would be um, loath to do so. But RED, it's R-E-double-D, stands for Reduced Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Destruction and Degradation. And um, this is a burgeoning industry, which I've always been very supportive of because it provides economic incentives for forest users to conserve forest rather than destroy it and bring it into, this, bring it into the sort of large-scale commercial production that Fred's been talking about. But it's... It's environmentally friendly, uh, but it's also potentially quite profitable because it generates carbon credits. Um, and while it is outside of the official UN framework at the moment, sustained largely by foreign aid donations through the United Nations and the World Bank, etc., and some private sector uh, carbon offsets, it does look, once some of the technical and political issues can be overcome, likely to grow as a potential temptation, shall we say, to those seeking to control land in order to capture the carbon credits and the potential profits involved. And as we already know, there are a number of um, investment companies which are based on this potential, and some of them seem to have been doing very nicely, thank you very much. There are something like 14 million hectares of forest carbon projects which could potentially fall under an official red umbrella if it were ever to become officially incorporated into the UNFCCC framework. Um, and on the face of it, this is brilliant, all right, because this is going to go a long way towards mitigating climate change, um, in theory preserving the livelihoods of those people, those populations who depend on the forest. Some of the populations which we saw in Fred's presentation have suffered at the hands of commercial farming and agricultural developers. But there is a dark side to this, I think. And the danger is that unscrupulous governments and commercial interests could use the carbon framework as a tool for controlling natural resources and gaining access to these profits. There is a risk, as we've seen in some projects so far, in some initiatives, that forest populations and indigenous groups could be displaced from control over their traditional lands or at least given token participation in order that outside interests might capture the benefits. It's estimated, well, Fred quoted this figure as, as in one of the examples he quoted in his book, that the local communities actually themselves attracted about 20% of the total benefits from one particular uh, carbon uh, forest project. And I would think that's pretty typical, actually, because most of the money gets absorbed in expensive consultancies um, and other costly, costly uh, inputs into the process, which don't necessarily end up by benefiting, benefiting the, the, the forest population and the indigenous groups 
uh, actually uh, involved. So there's all sorts of carbon cowboys, fraudsters, and potential for cor corruption involved in this. And, and I'm a strong supporter of red, okay? I'm not here to denigrate red and, and criticize it. But one has to recognize the dark side. So the potential benefits to communities could be considerably smaller than anticipated, than is, that are publicized by the organizations that, that um, deal with these schemes. And uh, the potential uh, profits could be much larger in, in commercial terms. So what is crucial, I mean, in terms of policy implications, I think, in this context, is two things. I think, firstly, that uh, red um, carbon verification standards be strictly implemented, that safeguards, social safeguards be built into these schemes, and that social analysis be incorporated to induce local participation by populations in their design and implementation in order that they be part and parcel of the whole process rather than mere tools which can be easily manipulated by unscrupulous interests who are out to seek, seeking maximum profits. The, the other essential item, of course, and this is what was obviously lacking in many of the cases, I think, that Fred quotes in his book, is local organization. People are simply not organized in order to stand up to commercial interests and to unscrupulous local officials and central governments. Um, whether it be in the case of uh, the sale, the unscrupulous sale of land and, and the eviction of local populations for commercial agricultural projects or whether it be under the guise of carbon sequestration, climate change mitigation schemes, uh, and, and uh, initiatives of, of a similar nature. They don't look the same on the surface, but they could potentially be two sides of a very similar coin. Um, one which would have a green face and one which doesn't really have a green face. So I think this, this particular aspect, you could almost write a book about it. Well, I just have done, in fact. Um, <laughs> a bit of publicity there. Um, you could almost write a book about it, and there are many books written about read as, as an issue, but usually from a technical standpoint in terms of green contextual issues rather than as a social issue. So um, those of you that want to rush out and buy a book, which is very good on this, um, here is one on forest and climate change. And um, it's an issue which uh, is certainly supported and strength in the, in the international debating arena by committed non-governmental organizations and the more serious climate change interests. But it's also one which is exploited and um, taken advantage of by some of the more unscrupulous commercial and uh, official interests. And that's something we have to be careful of because this could lead to a, uh, as Fred was saying, a sort of an environmental green grab if we're not very, very careful. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, carbon cowboy is certainly not a term I had heard before, yeah, yeah. so that is interesting. Over to you now, Charlie. Uh, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Fred. Oh, is it not on? The mic. No, just a bit more into so, the mic. Please. Can you hear me at the back? Okay. Thank you very much, Fred, and thank you, Eric. Um, okay, um, I will talk a bit more about the sort of food side of it. So I think I want to start by talking about what is meant by sort of land grabbing. Um, but I will, before I do that, I want to say it's actually a really, really good read, this book. It really does eliminate the issues on land grabbing. <coughs> and given that we don't actually still don't know much about this issue, given its early days, um, not a lot of good research has been done on this topic. I think it's fair to say the book is uh, it's very colourful. Some very interesting characters in there, which Fred did talk about. I mean, some real kind of proper cowboys out there. But also, I should say, that the book is actually a lot more nuanced than the presentation. Um, the presentation may give, give the impression that it's all absolutely terrible out there, which is why somewhere we need to sort of get a handle on what we mean by land grabbing. It's a term I don't particularly like very much. Um, for some people, land grabbing, basically agricultural investment, is people putting in money into countries that are not their own, 
to try and invest in the land, invest in agricultural productivity and possibly benefit those living on the land. For others, and in other cases, land grabbing is like a sort of neo-colonial exercise in stealing land. Now the thing is, both of those definitions are relevant. It depends which case you're talking about. So if you read the book, there's a lot more nuance in there. Even within a given country, you will see certain cases where you see both going on at the same time. Good cases where people are really are investing in local people, local infrastructure, investing in agricultural productivity. And, uh, and other cases, within the same country, even with the same crop, who are doing exactly the opposite. The case of Liberia is a good one. So you describe an example of an enclave where they basically fenced off a whole area of land to grow, if I remember right, palm oil. Um, and, but even within the enclave, they were providing education, uh, healthcare services, much better than the average for Liberia as a whole. And another case, the one you mentioned in the talk, where it wasn't enclave, it wasn't cut off, they actually had sharing contract agreements with local farmers, or buying produce of local farmers. So the story is a lot more nuanced than the term land grabbing would suppose, and I hate the term land grabbing. I think it's really misleading, and I think it's almost perjurative, and I would be very careful with that. I would not, you know, at what point does land grabbing become foreign, uh, foreign direct investment and vice versa? I think that's an important point to make. So the issue of this land grabbing comes to, really relates to agricultural production, and also with respect to sort of green, um, green issues as well, green grabbing, another stupid term. I won't focus so much on the green grabbing, I'll focus on food production, because that was really what most of the talk was about. I think most of the book is, is, a, is about is food production. I think this is really important, and I think the book does highlight what we do and don't know about agricultural production um, <clears throat> with respect to certain countries around the world, or as you say, oil shakes, Chinese billionaires, whoever, all these people, like a very colourful book, um, investing in, in land in order to secure food supplies for their own countries. In other words, some countries are going to parts of Africa to secure land in order to feed their, their own hungry populations. So is it the poor stealing from the poor to some extent? Um, <clears throat> the thing is, the reality is that we still don't know a lot about what's going on on the ground. What seems to be the case is that where these deals actually take place and where they're actually implemented, because many of these deals are just on paper. So the, the Oxfam figure of 200 million hectares, well, in reality, we don't actually know how much land has been um, secured for these kind of bilateral agricultural deals. Um, <clears throat> it's only a matter of time before we actually see how much is going on, on the ground. And the thing is, my take on this is that, for the most part, a lot of this investment really won't come to light. The reason being is that many of the countries where the investment is taking place are themselves so poor um, and so, um, um, if you like, um, <coughs> racked by conflict uh, with weak civil society and so on, it's unlikely that these, that these investments will ever really come off over the long run. Um, nonetheless, where the deals are taking place and where they are being implemented, we are seeing evidence of a gradual enclosure of the commons where people who formerly would have been using these areas of land for their own subsistence and so on, are being gradually excluded from that. And that's definitely a serious issue that you have raised very well in the book. Um, <clears throat> but beyond that, it's really quite difficult to see what's going on, um, apart from the contestation over land. But that brings me to the third point in the race about the cause. You know, what's actually driving all of these land deals? Why are these countries securing these deals? And you did actually raise this towards the beginning of the talk, in the, in the book as well. The issue of high food prices uh, around 2008, actually just before 2008, food prices were going through the roof, and many countries that couldn't grow their own food or don't grow enough food of their own were looking to secure food supplies for the future. But then you also say, quite rightly, you know, I was trying to um, recall where uh, earlier on where I can get some stats for this, that the food, uh, sorry, the world does grow enough food. So what's the issue here? The issue here is clearly that countries that have to set up bilateral deals to um, um, secure food supplies are unable to purchase that food from commodity markets. It's an issue of, of, of the commodity markets, it's the issue of distribution of food rather than um, actually growing more food. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's actually probably more, you know, from a policy angle of more relevance is how to fix global food markets and distribution of food in order to, to ensure that those, including those in the Gulf states, can actually um, feed their own populations. Stop there. Fred, do you immediately want to respond, or can we open it up for... Just, sure. just very quickly, because I think we do need to open it up. Um, 
I think on red and um, the, the problem, the perils of green grabs within red, I mean, that's, it's, a, it's a major issue. It seems to me that in some parts of the world, parts of Latin America, uh, local communities, indigenous groups and so on with, with secure land rights are in the process of uh, being able to profit from uh, selling the carbon capture in their forests. Uh, they, have the, they have the power, they have the facility to do it, and they are employing their own consultants to do it. Uh, but in much of the rest of the world, you see it in Indonesia, you see it in the various few parts of Africa where, it, where it's been tried, it re it, they really do seem to be losing out. It's become an excuse for, um, for outsiders to take over their forests. And uh, it's a, it, it becomes another form of green grab, as, as you say. Um, on Charlie, yes, I mean, there, there are, some people take, as, as indeed you do, the, the term land grabbers. Um, it's a difficult one, but it, it does capture something, I think. Um, I think it, 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 it's a piece of shorthand, and as a journalist, you know, I'm attracted to it. But also academics, I mean, you know, there are academic conferences. I've been to two of them, two major international conferences, where the title is Land Grabbers. They are, within the, with, within the academic community, there is discussion about whether it's an appropriate phrase, and a lot of people conclude that its, its simplicity is useful. Yes, of course, it, um, it confuses, if you like, good land grabs in the useful foreign investment um, and more kind of uh, feral kind of um, attitude to land. Uh, but within the phrase, we, you know, we can discuss it. I think it's, it's a useful starting point. So I, uh, I understand what you say, but I, d I don't apologize for using it. Numbers, yet yeah, nobody knows the numbers. Um, Oxfam has numbers, the World Bank has numbers, a number of other groups have numbers, and they're wildly different about exactly how much land has been grabbed, and of course much will depend on your definition. Most of them actually go back to NGO sources and NGOs that are trying to count the land mentioned in newspaper reports. There's been some rather dodgy academic research which is basically doing just that and then dressing it up as academic research when really it's just a, uh, it's, it's a sort of uh, research of newspaper reports. And you get a rather dangerous spiral where then the journalists report the academic findings as if they were academic findings. And the whole thing becomes very sticky. Nobody knows. Uh, what I can tell you is that, is that a lot of the land grabs have not turned into anything formally on the ground. A lot of them are just paper grabs. Uh, nothing much is happening. Sometimes the land is fenced off, so people can't use the land, but there's no actual agriculture going on. But in other areas, this would be not counted. I mean, the... the, the takeover of parts of Paraguay that I was talking about. Nobody's counted that in. That doesn't turn up, so far as I can see, in any of the number counting allowances. So, you know, some of it's... it's it, nobody knows. Some of the numbers are too high, some are too low. Drivers, um, I agree with you about um, analysing the failures of the market. There's some stuff in the book about that. Um, as, as you say, and as I say, there is actually plenty of food around. The question is whether the market can deliver it to the people who need it. Um, and indeed ensure that what we need is, is grown. It's not, a it's not a shortage of land. It's not a, ultimately a shortage of food. It's a failure of markets. Okay, thank you very much. So we will uh, open it up now to questions from the audience. Uh, can we collect three each time? If you please say your name, who you are, and could you also say, because we have three speakers, to whom your question is mainly addressed. A question is a question. We had already three presentations. Please, please keep it short and neat. I'm going to start with the lady over there first, then you, and then the lady here. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is... Is it on? Yeah. My name is Nami, um, and this is a question for Ms. Pierce. Um, just when, when you were talking about governments and investors, um, I guess my question is, if you were going to put pressure on one of those two groups in whether it's codes um, of practice or anything in the future, which group would you go to first? Okay, thank you. Gentleman over here. Yeah. Here, 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 here. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Liam. Uh, I'm a student here, Master... Uh, in environmental economics. Uh, my question is also addressed to uh, Mr. Piers. Um, my question is, uh, who would you uh, assign to deal with these issues? Because uh, it happens in a context of national sovereignty. 
Um, who do you address? The Western countries? I mean, for instance, the U.S. was built on land, on a land-grabbing way back. And is it that big of a problem? Uh, Kofi Annan was speaking here on October 4th, and the question was raised to him, how does he feel about China's investments in Africa? And he said, initially, I agree with them, but if they turn out to be bad contracts, then they will not stand the test of time because new political leaders will be uh, installed and they, will not, they, they, don't have to, they don't have to comply with the contracts that were written. So I okay. don't, yeah. Thank you very much. The lady here, can we have a mic? It's just one. The lady here, just behind the camera. This um, pony. Uh, this is about um, a slightly different type of land grabbing, but uh, in due course, uh, soon we are all going to put all these land grabbing in a very bigger context with other problems uh, facing mankind. Uh, this, my problem is uh, land grabbing. In some countries, um, uh, some oppressive uh, uh, unjust governments are giving the land of the poor, the marginalized, to tourism developers. Um, so, that is a que now a question is coming. Uh, you, we have to balance the land of the, uh, the livelihood land of the poor uh, against the uh, land of the um, uh, uh, tourist resorts or something like top of the rich. Um, I come from uh, North Sri Lanka where the people are right now under the boots of the army and the people who are displaced by aerial bombing and shelling and put in camps are now being dumped in uh, clear jungles and not allowed to go to their coastal villages which are being sold to tourism um, businessmen uh, it may be indigenous or uh, foreign, uh, this thing. Okay. So we are going to face a bigger problem. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to start with Fred, but of course, if Anthony or Charlie want to say something as well, you chip in. Okay, um, governments or investors, who to put pressure on? I mean, uh, ultimately, I mean, this has to be about government within the countries who have the land. Much of what is happening is a failure of the government within those countries. So my approach... Um, and this relates also to the question about national sovereignty. My approach is, is that you know, those countries need better governance. The people who live on the land need a bigger voice. Um, and it is ultimately about setting up demographic institutions. Um, I'm a little wary about whether it's me or Greenpeace or Oxfam or whoever it is pontificating about land issues in other countries without engaging with uh, groups within those countries who are fighting on these issues. Because um, you, you really have to um, be supportive of what's happening within those countries. Otherwise, I think in practical terms, you won't get anywhere. Um, and you know, politically, it becomes another form of, uh, of, in, of imperialism, if you like. So one has to do that. Within that, I think there's an awful lot that can be done. Um, corporate people are very wary of, uh, if you like, corporate risk, um, and part of their corporate risk is their reputational risk. They've had a kind of free ride with land grabbing for a while. You can go and there really hasn't been a downside to doing some quite dodgy things. But as NGOs and others get uh, a voice uh, and start campaigning on these issues, there will be risks to them, and I think that will make them back off. But I think fundamentally it has to be about supporting uh, people within countries and trying to improve governance there. Um, I think that probably really does answer the question about national sovereignty. That's where I think things lie. Um, I'm not against tourist developments in principle. I am in, against tourist developments that are dumped on people and on people's land without them having a say. I, I pointed very briefly to that tourist lodge in Kenya run by Maasai people for the, with the profits being used within their community. Absolutely in favor of that. Um, the problem very often with these is, is, is outsiders coming in, whether they're domestic elites or foreign elites. Um, frequently they're in cahoots at all, of course. Mm -hmm. Anthony and Charlie, did you want to add or shall we okay. ask for more? 
questions. Okay, we'll go for more questions then. Uh, can I have the gentleman here? My student in the, I forgot your name, but I remember her. <laughs> student on the top and the gentleman over there. So one, two, three. Stephen Woodley, I'm a visitor to town. Uh, I, I wonder about the, the, the weight of the green grab problem versus the rest of the issue. Because the example you gave for green grabbing was from Kenya. And Kenya hasn't made a new national park in 25 years. Uh, and we, one place we do have good data is the growth of, of green protected areas around the world. And those are mostly now, almost exclusively, with communities rather than against communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Robin. Robin. Just refresh your memory. <laughs> um, we'll see you tomorrow. Um, so, <laughs> <Thursday>. <laughs> uh, so my question is for um, Charlie, I guess. Um, you said that you prefer policies addressing uh, redistribution of food. Um, that's already within the system, and I feel like that could probably get at the land grabbing issue. So I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit more about that, or yeah, instead of like putting pressure on governments and um, uh, investors addressing it at the redistribution level. Hi, my name's Ed. I don't have an affiliation. Um, my my question is, um, Fred, you mentioned that the problem of local people not providing their consent. Um, when it comes to land purchases. Is the problem also the fact of um, a lack of informed consent? Are there examples where local people um, have sold their land but not fully understood the implications that uh, those sales will have on their livelihood? Should we start with you, Fred, and then? Uh, yes, on the last one, yes, it very, uh, very often is. Um, it also can be local chiefs um, who have uh, speak for their people, um, but kind of don't really speak for their people anymore. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of issues. Uh, there are certainly people who don't understand the, the detail of what's of what's been approved and what's not. So yes, you're abs you're, you're absolutely right. Um, there are, and there are it's difficult to generalise, but but just basic understanding of what's going on and what the implications of deals that are proposed to people can be very difficult. And indeed, the scale of compensation that they might expect. Um, on green grab and um, yes, maybe 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 you're right. Actually, Kenya made. I mean, Kenya is an example of the, the, the amount of land that we can be talking about. I mean, large parts of Kenya are given over to national parks and quite a lot more land to private reserves now. Um, now, you're right that some of those are, are um, not just there but elsewhere are community projects, but an awful lot aren't. I mean, I spent quite a lot of time in the book looking at privately owned um, sort of safari parks for tourists, um, top end uh, um, establishments uh, across southern Africa and, and eastern Africa and there are, there are some in Latin America as well and elsewhere. Um, so I don't think what I'm talking about has gone away and you do find that you know the Ted Turners and the uh, Richard Bransons of this world are, are buying up big chunks of land and and then turning them into into tourist places, uh, except for the sort of couple of weeks a year when they perhaps want to go there themselves. So I think there's um, yes, there is there are good projects, of course. There is good stuff being done. I'm in favour of them, but I really don't think the bad stuff has gone away. Um, Fred, can I just ask you, in terms of percentage, what do you think is green grabbing the way you perceive it? Um, well, it, it, it depends on what you call a green grab. I mean, 10% of the land surface of the planet is, is protected in some manner, but I wouldn't wish to suggest that all that was green grab. Mm -hmm. um, there is, a, there is a, a rather acrimonious and indeed unpleasant debate that goes on between environmental groups and anthropologists, social anthropologists, about the circumstances um, under which various communities have been persuaded, shall we say, to leave protected areas, um, and whether that should be regarded as kind of evictions or not. Um, there's more heat and light in that debate, um, and I don't really want to take sides on it, because I don't think either side come out of it particularly well. Okay. Charlie. So I just want to add to the um, question of protected areas. There's no question in the last 20, 30 years there's been a 
quite a huge change in terms of how protected areas are managed all the way around the world, given that many protected areas are, particularly in developing uh, areas, are effectively paper parks. They only exist on paper. In reality, they are open access areas. People can go in and out as they choose. But the issue where they, where they are actually effectively protected is, particularly with conservation groups, they believe that, you know, that there's a Biodiver protecting biodiversity comes at a cost of excluding local people. But the last 10, 20 years, we have seen, not just in public parks, but also in private initiatives, which are a relatively recent phenomenon of, of, of trying to engage local people. Because people who run these places realize that over the long run, these areas cannot be sustained over time without involvement of local people. They are destined to fail. So I do think there's been a huge shift in attitudes and also in terms of of policy in terms of actually engaging with local people. They haven't always worked out. Of course they don't. But in terms of where we were 20, 30 years ago, where protected areas were very much fenced and fine, keep people out, we've certainly moved a long way in the last few decades, I think. I, I'd agree with much of that, but, uh, but don't confuse um, involvement and engagement with control. There's an awful lot of involvement that kind of, you know, when push comes to shove, really they're just the natives and, you know, they don't understand the ecosystem or whatever. So, yes, I agree. It is a lot better than it was. But, uh, anyway. Yes, yeah, so also be bearing in mind the fact that some of these issues are actually quite complex. Things like the sale of carbon rights and uh, benefits, uh, benefit sharing in, amongst indigenous communities. I mean, these are not necessarily easy things to grasp. So even if there is token participation, quite often this can, as, as Fred says, be in effect subject to sort of localized forms of, of control and co-optation. Uh, while I also agree with Charlie that there has been massive progress in the last couple of decades in terms of involving local populations and the greater comprehension of the issues involved. I mean, if only because, as Charlie says, you know, the, the custodians of natural resources and forests are essential, essentially the local people. Without that, as you say, it doesn't work. You, know, you can't just have a few rangers and park keepers and the old helicopter and land rover to, to do justice to uh, millions of hectares. Okay, we'll have a new set of questions staying well clear of my students in order not to further reveal my ignorance of uh, names. <laughs> uh, we'll have the lady in the uh, white jumper uh, first, then the one with the plaque up there, and then we'll go to the gentleman with the glasses there in the middle. Thank you. Oh, uh, uh, do you remember? Robin, state your question again, please. Robin, did you? Robin, Robin, I must, I must confess, I didn't understand your question very well. But then, you know, I'm not the expert. Uh, we'll have you as a fourth, and you'll restate your. All right, we'll go here with the lady first. Yes, um, thank you very much. My name is Beatrice Groth. Um, I want to say, first of all, thank you to Professor Eric Neumeyer uh, for having, raising this awareness over Africa. And um, uh, this, the whole thing to me looks like another exploitation of Africa. Um, Africa has been once exploited. I'm, I'm a student of uh, journalism, University of East London. Uh, and I do also politics. Um, looking into the history of Africa, I think everybody should start helping Africa to stand and not to fall. So every effort we make to bring Africa down is pushing Africans back to Europe. And everybody, all Europeans, are blocking ways for Africans to enter. But if there is problem at home, just like the birds, when the weather changes here, they go somewhere else. You can't stop them. My question is, sir, how can you, or all of you, help us 
to stop this exploitation on Africa. They've been once exploited as slaves, and now they're exploiting their land and their property. So I think the question is again on policy. Yes, I came address. from Nigeria, German Nigeria. And in Nigeria, the waters, the oil companies have ruined mm -hmm. the Nigerian land. Mm -hmm. People can no more farm. They don't, in Africa, nobody receives benefit like they do in Europe. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the source of crime is because of poverty. And people who can farm on their land, fish their food, are no more able to do these things. And the government is not supporting them. Majority of the government, they are 99.9% criminals. So nobody is supporting the poor man. So at the end of the day, it's coming back to, to where, what we are talking about, okay. exploitation. Okay. Please, how can this help to stop exploitation okay. of the Africans? Very good question. Can we have the, the lady up there in the plaque? Yes, please. Hi, um, my name is Artemis, and um, thanks so much, Fred, for holding this talk. This is actually just a question for Anthony. Um, in relation to carbon rights, do you think that there's maybe too much focus on market mechanisms such as emission trading schemes and the, um, the red mechanism? And do you think that there should maybe be more focus on legislation on ca carbon capture storage? Um, and do you think that this could maybe be a threat to carbon rights in the future? And the gentleman here with the classes. Hi there, um, Andrew Gordon McLean. I'm a researcher for um, International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED. Um, a question, perhaps reflecting on some of the, the, the comments tonight, which is um, prior informed consent, and also how do you stop exploiting people? So my my question really is is going back to I think, um, and this is both to uh, Anthony Hall and to Fred Fred Pierce. Um, within this kind of process, it's very difficult to find, I and mean, I wouldn't certainly, from experience I've, I've got from looking at some um, land deals that went on between biofuel companies and communities, when you go out and you actually, you talk to the companies and you go out and talk to the communities, their understanding of what went on is exceedingly different. And the power relationship is, is I mean, the... the um, uh, the difference in power between those two parties is huge. So as the watchdog, as a kind of a, a fair broker within these deals that go on, because a lot of communities will end up having very unrealistic expectations and often local, uh, often government people don't help that at all, and they then end up losing out. So my question really is, who could be those types of on the honest broker within that process? Okay, good question as well. Fred. Yeah, I think both questions are, are a bit the same, actually, in, in, in my approach to them at any rate. Um, yes, Africa suffers hugely from exploitation. Yes, it's sometimes, I hate to generalize, but can be its own worst enemy. Some countries, governments can be. I think, actually, African people have to start asserting their control over their own resources, over their own land, and say no, and not feel that they have to invite in every foreign investor who wants to come in because um, they, they sort of feel they need to. There has to be a kind of, uh, perhaps lose a, the sense of the sort of victimhood, which I think does... Um, can be a problem under some circumstances and just be a bit more assertive. And that really comes from my thinking is really, as I was answering the question earlier about what outsiders can do, is outsiders can in invest in helping political processes within African countries, encouraging NGOs. I think NGOs are absolutely critical as honest brokers in many of these activities, best NGOs certainly. In, and by NGOs, I don't just mean groups in cities or groups that are part of an international network. I mean, I mean, groups living in forests, uh, campesino networks, and whatever you like. But the sort of civil society, just to outsiders can help them develop expertise and knowledge and the confidence to pursue campaigns about issues like that. And you do see it happen. You see it happen a lot in Liberia. We've talked about Liberia 
wonderful NGOs very active there and linking up with other groups across West Africa. That, I'm sure, is the way forward. Groups like IIED, I believe, do a fantastic job in helping link up those groups, helping provide resources for them. But ultimately, the politics has to happen within African countries. It can't be done outside, and it shouldn't be done outside. Okay. Yes, I mean, I, I, would, um, I would certainly um, endorse what Fred has said. In terms of, to take the second question first, in terms of trying to do something about the very unequal, very asymmetric power relationships which exist between the um, holders of power, as it were, and local communities, the people on the ground, it is a serious issue. Um, people, traditional peoples, often don't understand what they're getting into. They don't have a clear understanding of the issues. They are very dependent on, as Fred says, the honest power brokers, mainly through civil society organizations, NGOs in particular, to lay it out before them and to make sure that they don't get the rough end of the stick. So it's all about building organization, building participation, and empowering empowering local groups to have an active, ro active role rather than being uh, trampled over at the end of the day. Not as easy as it might sound sometimes. We academics often talk about the beauties of empowerment, but how that is actually reflected on a day-to-day -day basis is another matter indeed, because there are many different layers in these power relationships. And we shouldn't over-romanticize NGOs either, because quite often they're in it for very selfish interests, very selfish reasons not necessarily having the altru altruistic concern for the poor that maybe they, sh they should have sometimes. But having said that, of course, there are many excellent, excellent organizations out there fighting for these issues. On, on the first question of um, carbon capture and storage, uh, I don't think it's an alternative for it. It's a compliment. I mean, there are still huge doubts about the kind of, of benefits of which RED is capable of delivering and um, optimists like myself often tend to paint a rosy picture in terms of the potential here but I think one has to uh, explore all the options. Uh, carbon capture and storage is, is not an area I'm particularly um, expert in to say the least but whatever options exist I think they should be, uh, they should be looked at together as complementary activities. Charlie? I just want to add a quick point to the point about the, um, how African countries can help themselves or what they can do. And I think, it's, again, generalizing is, is not very satisfying in a way. I mean, it's obviously there's a huge diversity of countries, some of which have quite strong civil society, some of which have quite strong democracies as well and are quite able to look after themselves and others, particularly when you had your examples, Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh, right at the opposite end of the scale. These are the countries that are most traumatized of all, and it's not, perhaps not surprising that a lot of these land deals are taking place in some of the most fragile states on earth, not just in Africa. So, again, you know, talk about Africa, we all know it's a complete waste of time generalizing, but those countries are pretty, pretty damn fragile. Okay. I think we could uh, continue this discussion forever, but unfortunately we have to come to a close. I know there are so many questions uh, unanswered. May I just remind you that the book is uh, outside for sale. If you want to get a copy, bring it back in for it to get signed. And then please join me in thanking both Fred... <laughs>